Okay, so welcome. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. This is part one, climate change and transmission pest and diseases in Southeast Asia with a focus on fall armyworm as part of a resistance and resilience workshop starter series um, that we're holding or hosting in August and September 2022. Uh, my name's Alison Watson. I'm going to be the moderator of today's session. I'm going to be helped with tech Tech Tay there, um, who is, you can see, uh, hopefully uh, on the board with a wave. Uh, and I have some wonderful speakers who I'll introduce shortly uh, as well. Just like to thank all uh, the sponsors and funders of the ASEAN Fall Army Women Action Plan, including Department of Foreign Affairs in Australia, uh, and also uh, the uh, new Secretariat of the ASEAN Fall Army Women Action Plan, CSIRO Australia. So really great to uh, have everyone on board and we've got a very full session so without further ado I'm just going to remind everyone and I know everyone uh, everyone is prof professionals almost at, at this now but if you could use the Q&A box uh, to ask your questions that would be most appreciated it just helps for us to uh, organize the questions as we go through um, please use the chat box to share resources introduce yourself I'm really keen to hear from everyone in the room for example if you're working on uh, climate change uh, and uh, plant pest and diseases for example, what you're doing. So please share that information as well. And if you um, would like to rename yourself, you can do that by clicking the participants and then clicking your name, clicking more, and you can um, rename yourself. And if you could provide the organization that you work for, that would also be very useful for us as well. Now, as I said, this is part one of a two-part series. So today we are looking at uh, exploring the intersection of climate change uh, and transboundary pests in Southeast Asia through a discussion on the breeding of new varieties of climate resilient and fall armyworm resistant varieties of maize. It will also explore the broader relationship between a changing climate and increasing transboundary plant pest and disease pressures and the importance of climate and therefore climate change as drivers of plant pest populations in Southeast Asia will be discussed along with an overview of the proposed work of the FAO IPPC focus group on climate change and phytosanitary issues. The session will conclude with a presentation and discussion on work that could be progressed to develop a strategy for Southeast Asia to respond to this growing threat to food production. And then our next session will be held on 6th of September and we'll explore the role of population genomics and understanding further the potential success of future strategies and tools that can be used in managing fall armyworm in a changing climate. This will be an exciting session with the latest research across Southeast Asia shared and discussed following on from a very successful workshop that was recently held in Singapore and by Dr. Tete, who's on board today. Now, Southeast Asia is among the world's most at-risk regions when it comes to the impacts of global warming. The UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, the IPCC, warned in a recent report that the region is facing rising sea levels, heat waves, droughts, and increasingly intense rainstorms. Recent studies estimate that up to 96% of the ASEAN region is likely to be affected by drought and up to 64% affected by extreme drought not to mention typhoons, sea level impacts and rain bombs. And this will have a serious impact on our farmers. Farmers will also have to respond to the growing risk of the spread of invasive plant pests and diseases in which climate change may contribute to their wider spread and their impact. It's critical now to help understand these threats, determine the range of responses that help, will help farmers adapt to these new challenges they'll face and build their resilience to climate change and new invasive species threats to their crops. Today, we have four fantastic speakers uh, to introduce this topic and explain from different perspectives some of the areas of work we consider to better position the region's food systems to be able to monitor and manage plant pests and diseases in a changing climate. Now here I just cut and paste some of the latest journal articles on the relationship between climate change and plant pest and disease. There's many, um, but you'll note some research there indicating factors such as expansion of geographic range, increased overwintering survival, increased number of generations, increased risk of invasive insect species and insect transmitted plant diseases, as well as changes in the interaction with host plants and natural enemies that climate change can actually uh, really uh, uh, increase uh, those 
risks. So there's a lot of work uh, to be done. Uh, understanding what uh, could be done in the region uh, is very important. And the speakers today will really touch upon some of these issues. And uh, before we get started um, with Dr. Prasanna uh, Budjapalli, who's going to be really kicking off the session, uh, I just wanted to introduce that we'll be having two uh, other sessions, one on the work plans of the IPPC focus group and one on the relationship between climate change and transboundary pests in Southeast Asia. Now, what I would like to do just before we get started with uh, Prasanna is I just wanted to have a quick poll and I'm just going to see if I can launch that now. It's not a scientific uh, poll, it's not a scientific questions, um, they're really just to get us warmed up, get everyone in the room uh, participating. So hopefully if you can see that you've got four questions, uh, anonymous, we won't be recording any results uh, and hopefully you can see that it might take a little while to come up. Yep, got my first response. So are you currently undertaking work or research looking at climate change and plant pest and disease management? Question two, do you think climate change will have an impact on plant pests and diseases? Question three, should we consider new varieties of climate resilient, heat example, heat tolerant and fall armyworm resistant maize? And question four is how important is managing resistance in fall armyworm populations across Southeast Asia? So if you can have a go at doing that, that would be great. Uh, now, it may be a bit difficult if you are logging in by phone, um, but for all those who are online, please have a go. We've got, I, I want to get at least 60% participating and we're almost there. So you've got probably about one more minute to, uh, to get your view in. And then I'm going to launch it. Okay, so we're actually over 70% of people have answered the survey. So I'll go at 75. Excellent work, guys. Looks uh, extremely good. So I might even be able to get to 80%. We've got a few more people. And I'm going to launch the poll now. The answers. So you'll see here some of the uh, responses, and I think uh, this is kind of interesting. Are you currently undertaking work or research looking at climate change and plant pest and disease management? We have 34% saying yes, 32% no, but I would like to. So uh, great, and 34% and who are saying no, I'm sure you're working on lots of other important uh, work as well. If you've said yes or, or no, but I would like to, please share what you're working on uh, in the chat. That will really help us have a really good discussion um, later on. Uh, question two, do you think climate change will have an impact on plant pests and diseases? 100% yes. Uh, three, should we consider new varieties of climate resilient and fall armyworm resistant maize? 95% yes, 5% I don't know. There we go, Prasanna, you've, you've got a very uh, receptive audience in front of you. And for how important is managing resistance in fall armyworm populations across Southeast Asia? Uh, everyone is saying important and extremely important 63%. Uh, so uh, that's going to be a good conversation as well. So you've got a very active, proactive audience in front of us. So I'm going to stop sharing that and I'm going to just move on. Uh, and that is not the uh, presentation because I'm going to invite Prasanna to really kick us off uh, this discussion. Um, Dr. Prasanna is the director of the Global Maze Program of CIMIT uh, since March 2010. He's based in Nairobi, Kenya, and is leading a strong multidisciplinary team across Africa, Asia, and Latin America with a major focus on delivering stress resilient and nutritious maize for the tropics. And Dr. Prasanna also helped lead the development of the resistance management program under the ASEAN Fall Armyworm Action Plan. Prasanna, it's always um, a privilege to have you uh, speak uh, and join us. So thank you very much for taking this time. And if you could load your, your presentation now, I, I think I have given you permission. Uh, so you should be able to just do that quite easily. Thank you. Can you, can you stop sharing the screen? Thanks. Yes, Alison. I can. There we go. Okay. Okay. I hope you can see the screen, Alison. 
Yeah, um, perfect. Okay. Thank you so much, Alison, uh, for the kind invitation for this important workshop. Um, the topic that I'm going to speak for the next 15, 20 minutes, Max, is about the challenges of climate change and falamivam, especially with regard to the maize sector in Southeast Asia. Uh, maize in the Asian tropics is typically vulnerable to an array of climatic extremes and variabilities. For example, uh, since more than 80 to 90 percent of the area in South and Southeast Asia is typically rain-fed maize, uh, it is highly vulnerable to drought and uh, water logging is seen in many parts of the uh, Asia, especially where there is uh, limited capacity for drainage. And then heat stress is becoming increasingly prevalent uh, together with the drought stress uh, in the Asian tropics. Uh, in addition to this, uh, there are an array of diseases, including banded leaf and sheath blight, tarsicum leaf blight, post-flowering stalk rots, as, as downy mildews, uh, which are particularly prevalent in Thailand, Indonesia, uh, Philippines, uh, and, and have a major impact on maize agri-food systems. Uh, global yield losses due to crop pests and diseases uh, is, is really uh, remarkably high. Uh, if you look at uh, the average yield losses and the ranges of yield losses, uh, you can see that it is almost 21.5% in wheat, almost 30% in case of rice, 22.6% in maize, 17.2% in potato, and 21% percent almost in soybean. Uh, coupled with this, there have been incursions of devastating transboundary pests and diseases over the last one decade. Africa alone has seen six devastating epidemics of uh, uh, crop pests and diseases in the last 10 years. Uh, and uh, these are, so uh, there is not only existing uh, pests and diseases, but there are new or emerging pests and diseases in continents like Africa and Asia. This has massive economic and environmental uh, implications, which was in one study estimated to be almost uh, $27 billion, billion dollar, uh, crop losses annually. Uh, so these risks are not just limited to maize, like fall army worm or maize lethal necrosis, but also in crops like banana, wheat, uh, tomato, vegetables, potato, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, CIMIT's, therefore, the focus of CIMIT's work in, in Asia is mainly to develop multiple stress-tolerant maize varieties that are adapted to Asian tropics. Uh, and our work uh, is quite unique in the sense that CIMIT is the first institution to come out with drought-tolerant and heat-plus drought-tolerant uh, yellow maize hybrids uh, for Asian tropics. Um, in the last few years, uh, 13 unique climate resilient maize hybrids have been licensed from CIMIT and are presently being commercialized by 27 small and medium enterprise seed companies in India, Nepal, Bangladesh, and Pakistan. Uh, and this is a, a very, very important development, especially because the rain fed maize yields in Asia is much, much lower than the irrigated maize yields. So our focus is not on irrigated maize but mostly on the rain-fed maize. Uh, this this uh, particular paper was cited by Allison too. Uh, it's, it's a publication on the scientific review of the impact of climate change on plant pests, uh, how the rising temperatures, changes in precipitation, atmospheric carbon dioxide increase, coupled with human activities and increased market globalization is making the situation highly favorable to increase the pest establishment as well as movement between continents and between countries within a continent. So there is a strong evidence already that climate change has expanded the host range and geographical distribution of some of the insect pests and pathogens and may further increase the risk of pest and pathogen introduction uh, to areas that are never seen before such incursions. So wha what are these emerging pests and pathogens? These are those that have inc either increased in their incidence, geography, or host range, 
or have changed the pathogenesis, pathogenesis or capacity for infestation. Uh, sometimes in new plant species, uh, they have newly evolved biotypes or pathotypes or have been newly discovered or recognized uh, among the existing ones. So you see uh, a direct impact of climate change is a increase in the incidence of emerging pests and pathogens besides the existing ones. This paper by Skenzik uh, last year shows how uh, specific factors like temperature or humidity or rainfall uh, could either positively or negatively affect the insect pest distribution, especially uh, temperature has a uh, has a positive impact on <laughs> insect pests that cause damage to the croplands, including expansion of geographic distribution, increased its survival during overwintering, increased in number of pest generations, altered synchrony between plants and pests, altered interspecific interactions, increased risk of invasion, and increased incidence of insect transmitted plant diseases, especially uh, in, in plant pests uh, groups like aphids, thrips, and beetles, and reduced effectiveness of biological control, especially by the natural enemies. So this is not a science fiction. This is already a reality and uh, which we need to tackle um, head on. Uh, this is the initiative that I am currently leading across the uh, CGIR institutions, uh, as well as the partner institutions of CGIR. It's called the Plant Health Initiative. Uh, this is one amongst the multiple initiatives that have been launched uh, in 2022. Uh, the initiative brings together 10 different CGIR centers, together with the demand, innovation, and scaling partners from multiple countries, uh, especially in the those working in the lower and middle income countries in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. Our aim is to, uh, to, to integrate uh, our strategies and to protect the agri-food systems uh, of these uh, uh, elmics in Africa, Asia, and Latin America from devastating pest and disease incursions or outbreaks uh, by not only co-creating, validating, and deploying innovations, but also by leveraging or building viable networks across an array of national, regional, and global institutions. Uh, Southeast Asia is obviously a very important focus region for uh, the Plant Health Initiative. Uh, so what are we trying to do uh, in this? Uh, it's, uh, it's not only about capacity building of the partners and improved communications on plant health innovations and their uh, efficacies and scalabilities and affordability, but also improved diagnostics, monitoring and surveillance, ecological modeling, prediction and risk assessment. Uh, better preparedness for proactive as well as rapid response when uh, transboundary pest incursions happen, and also take strongly into consideration gender and social inclusion uh, in our pest management uh, strategies. Uh, these are this is a snapshot of uh, the pests and diseases that have been prioritized. One can literally talk about uh, dozens of pests and diseases that can affect uh, uh, the agri-food systems, but uh, our resources do not permit handling uh, all of them. But we, in the first three years, the phase one, we'll be particularly focusing on these particular uh, prioritized plant health threats. Uh, and this indicates whether this particular pest will be the target in Eastern and Southern Africa, Western Central Africa, the Sivana region, South Asia, Southeast Asia, and Latin America and Caribbean. Uh, so Fala Miwam is undoubtedly uh, an important uh, plant health threat that we would like to tackle through partnerships, uh, not only in Eastern and Southern Africa, Western Central Africa, but also in South Asia and Southeast Asia. Uh, there are other crops, rice, wheat, maize, banana, potato, sweet potato, cassava, yam, uh, food legumes, vegetables, uh, and tomato. Uh, Cabi, Isipe, and World Wedge are some of the important innovation partners working with us in this, and it could be potentially expanded to multiple uh, institutions that would like to join hands uh, in this effort. The Plant Health Initiative, in fact, builds upon uh, a robust foundation of, uh, of diverse projects that have been implemented in the last 10 years by CGR centers and partners including those on Falamiwam, 
maize lethal necrosis in eastern and southern Africa and West Africa. The banana bunchy top virus. Uh, this is an alliance, again, the BBTV alliance. Uh, the potato disease management, the cassava brown streak uh, disease uh, network, uh, especially in, in Africa. Uh, as we look at this, it's not about only breeding. It also, uh, we, we, we are focusing on integrated pest and disease management uh, by, by, by bringing together relevant IPM tactics based on specific agroecologies and the socioeconomic context of the farmers and the regulatory landscape within uh, that particular country. Uh, so it's it's about resistance, it's about agroecological management, biological control, biopesticides. So all will be an important component of the strategy, not just one or two specific tactics. Uh, coming to the resistance, uh, host plant resistance is undoubtedly fundamental or uh, is a central core of uh, integrated pest management. And uh, as Alison requested, I wanted to quickly highlight that there's a tremendous opportunity uh, in South and Southeast Asia uh, to bring together institutions to work more intensifiedly on uh, breeding for climate resilience together with falami worm resistance. Uh, the approach that CIMIT typically is taking here is uh, our major focus is on native genetic resistance to falami worm. Of course, we do work in Africa uh, together with Bayer and other uh, national partners on a project called Taylor that focuses on BT maize technologies. But 95% of our efforts in Latin America, Africa, and Asia are focused on uh, native genetic resistance to follow me one. And this is because in maize, there is a tremendous uh, variability, genetic variation for important traits like insect resistance, especially the Cuban flints and the taxpanos are some of the major sources of insect resistance, uh, not only to the fall amoeba, but also other major insect pests like stem borers. Uh, since 1990s, the CIMIT maize team in Mexico has not only unraveled this genetic variation for this uh, important uh, pests, but also started building up populations, elite populations like uh, multiple insect resistance, tropical or multiple borer resistant populations. And using that foundation, uh, when the pest broke out in Africa, we quickly established in 2017, a vast network of screen houses. This is world's largest fall army bomb screening facility, period. 16 big screen houses, almost uh, one, uh, one fourth the size of an acre each, and each capable of of evaluating multiple entries, more than 300 entries you can evaluate in each crop, uh, in each of these greenhouses under replicated conditions. Using this greenhouse facility, we have uh, uh, systematically screened Africa's germplasm together with Simit's germplasm from Mexico uh, under Fala Miwam artificial infestation. The reason for building this greenhouse complex is we did not want to do uh, artificial infestation studies uh, in the open field conditions as, uh, as there are farming communities uh, which also grow maize. We don't want them to be unnecessarily scared of these kinds of experiments. Uh, and uh, so this work has been happening pretty intensively over the last uh, six years uh, in, uh, in Kenya. And uh, Alison asked me, uh, can we combine climate resilience with fall amoeba resistance? Undoubtedly we can, uh, but these are the steps. It's not easy. Uh, one needs to have the right combinations of parent lines for constituting several hybrids. Uh, and these parent lines must offer multiple traits, not just fall amoeba resistance, but climate resilience, uh, like drought tolerance or heat tolerance, disease resistance, or other farmer preferred traits. Then you need to do extensive on-station evaluation uh, for, the, for the traits like yield, disease resistance, or uh, drought tolerance, low nitrogen tolerance, heat stress tolerance, drought plus heat tolerance, and so on. Then we also simultaneously undertake choice experiments. That means multiple entries grown in a greenhouse and evaluated under artificial infestation. After mass rearing of the Fala Mewam neonate larvae uh, in our insectary in Katumani, uh, 
which is about a few kilometers from uh, Kibako. And then these neonate larvae are systematically infested at the V5 or V7 stage, depending whether they are inbred lines or hybrids. And we also repeat this neonate larval infestation at the reproductive stage onset. And these choice experiments provide us an idea, initial idea, which particular entries are germplasm or hybrids has the capacity to tolerate falamiwam infestation. Uh, but then we then take a subset of those candidate for promising hybrids and undertake no choice trials uh, in screen houses that are partitioned. And in one partition, in one chamber, we, we undertake experiment only on one particular entry. Along with commercial checks, the same experiments were repeated. These are no choice trials. That means either the insect finishes off that crop or the crop resists the particular uh, insect. And under the no choice trials, if a hybrid performs extremely well, that means it's a litmus test that here is truly native genetic resistance uh, in action. Then we take these promising hybrids and extensively evaluate them on form in multiple countries to assess the farmer's preferences, as well as performance under natural falamiwam infestation. Then using both on-station and on-farm data, we advance the products. Then the products are announced for the partner's uptake and the partners nominate those hybrids to national performance trials. Then varietal registration release happens, followed by seed scale up and commercialization. So friends, it's not a easy task. It requires technical know-how. It requires optimization of protocols, but it is achievable. And that's what you see here. The mass rearing of falamiwam neonates, uh, these protocols have been given in these two manuals, the falamiwam in Africa manual, published in 2018 by Summit together with USAID, and the more recent in 2021, the falamiwam in Asia, a guide for integrated pest management. So mass rearing, followed by germplasm screening under artificial infestation and happening both at vegetative and reproductive stages, systematic rating of germplasm, not only for foliar damage, but also for ear damage and the harvest traits. And then you can see under no choice, under choice trials, that means with multiple entries within a screenhouse, you can systematically differentiate an inbred line with resistance compared to one with susceptibility side by side. Similarly, one with resistance, one with susceptibility and so on. And these inbred lines, which are building blocks for the hybrids have been uh, disseminated to 92 institutions in 34 countries globally in the last three years, including right from Africa, Asia, Latin America, North America, Europe, Australia, uh, you can see the NARS, advanced research institutions, commercial seed companies, which have been recipients of some of these uh, excellent inbred lines, which can offer native genetic resistance. But the important thing is how do hybrids perform under no choice trials? You can look at a tolerant hybrid and its yield with clean ears compared to a susceptible commercial check, which is devastated in the no choice experiment with very poor yield and you can see these black spots are nothing but those ears that have been damaged by falamiwam uh, because falamiwam can attack the ears, bore into it and uh, eat the developing kernels. These hybrids, the three falamiwam tolerant hybrids have been nominated by partners uh, for national performance trials in 12 countries. Uh, South Sudan has already released them. Uh, in May 2022, uh, countries like Kenya, Uganda, Zambia, Malawi, Zimbabwe, they're all on the way. And we expect these varietal releases by quarter four of 2022 or the beginning of quarter one of 2023. So already a massive evaluation of these hybrids have happening uh, in Africa. There is no reason why these white maize hybrids can not be uh, utilized in Southeast Asia, especially in countries like Philippines uh, or in uh, other countries like uh, where white maize is grown. Uh, and at the same time, we are doing parallelly work on falamiwam resistance in yellow maize germplasm. Uh, we established screen houses in Ikrisat campus at Hyderabad. 
And now we are in the process of developing similarly falamibam tolerant hybrids in yellow kernel background. So in summary, friends, Simit's work in Sub-Saharan Africa clearly demonstrates that there is a tremendous opportunity to diversify falamibam management options, uh, especially for those smallholder farming communities which cannot afford uh, to have costly options uh, to use. Uh, native genetic resistance together with climate resilience and other farmer preferred traits is very much possible in a crop like maize. Uh, there is definitely a need for targeted investment in Southeast Asia and South Asia. This is exactly not happening. We are giving innumerable <laughs> talks, but these talks need to translate into action. Uh, we need to invest in, uh, in the ASEAN uh, efforts on, on, on things like this. Otherwise we are missing uh, a huge, huge opportunity to serve the farming communities. Insect resistance management, once again, this resistance offered by the hybrids that I'm talking about is typically polygenic. It's not oligogenic or monogenic like transgenic resistance. Polygenic resistance is usually partial it's not complete, like it, it's not like a toxins released by transgenics uh, or Bt maize and exerts tremendous selection pressure on the insect to evolve, reveal, uh, evolve, uh, to evolve resistance to that particular pest. Here it is, it is multiple pathways involved, including as, uh, not only a, 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 a morphological traits, but also capacity to uh, what we call produce metabolites uh, like uh, terpenoids. Uh, and this is the work that is presently being done in collaboration with IRAD France. So even in countries where Bt maize is being deployed, the polygenic native genetic resistance can be highly complementary to the oligogenic transgenic resistance. If I were a, a, a multinational company or uh, any, com any technology provider who has the capability to develop and deploy Bt maize, I will not try to put transgene in any genetic background but I will particularly choose those climate resilient, native genetic resistant backgrounds and systematically integrate or introduce the, the trait, uh, the, the BT events. And that's how you can prolong or you can, you can make insect resistance management uh, much more effective. Uh, with that, thank you so much. I hope I stayed in time. You did very well, Prasanna, as always. Uh <laughs> Uh, a professional at uh, these sorts of things and um, extremely interesting presentation and I uh, fully agree I think we need to get into the action part uh, of um, this work um, discussions leading to action is always a good a good outcome um, you have quite a few questions and I've got a few questions as well we've got one here from Andy Prasanna um, based on my field experiences in Indonesia fall armyworm seems like it causes more damage in the early vegetative stage of corn fortunately the stage is capable of recovery um, so that it impacts less in term of yield reduction compared to the damage during the generative stage. Are there any lines that are capable of resistance, tolerance to fall armyworm for the whole corn season? Of course, the, the resistance that is offered by uh, the, the one which I'm talking about, native genetic resistance, lasts the entire cropping season. It's not just at foliar stage or at uh, only reproductive stage. That's the reason why you see not only healthy looking crop plants at the foliar stage, but also healthy ears with extremely minimal damage to the ears uh, by the fall bomb. You can even, if you come to those no choice trials, you will see minimal uh, holes, ear holes uh, in a tolerant or resistant hybrid compared to a susceptible hybrid, which will be having lots of ear holes. That means the, the, the husk is so loose, or the, the genotype is so attractive to the, to the fall armyworm that it can bore through it and eat away the kernels. So the resistance indeed lasts the whole crop season. Excellent. Thanks, Prasanna. What is the estimated timeline from choice experiments to variety release and registration? Yes, uh, the no choice trials can be done within one crop season because no choice trials have a very high heritability and uh, we have we achieve almost 0.8 to 0.9 heritability under no choice trial. So it doesn't need to be repeated in multiple locations or multiple crop seasons. Once we do for one season after a choice trial, 
then, uh, but remember, we are not just breeding for fall amoebom resistance. It also needs to have other traits that are preferred by the smallholders, including grain yield. There should be no compromise on other important traits like drought tolerance or heat tolerance. That is the biggest, biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. uh, you just don't want fall amoebom resistance, but susceptible to other diseases or highly vulnerable to climate uh, induced stresses. So this on-station evaluation typically happens for two or three years uh, till we have very solid hybrids with all the necessary traits. Then on farm, then after we have on-station, that means including no choice trials, on farms uh, evaluations happen in one crop season across several hundred sites. One yeah. crop season is more than sufficient. And then you nominate, you announce the product, then the partners have to nominate it for national performance trials. National performance trials typically take one year or two years, depending upon the country's regulations. Yeah. So, but at the same time, you also need to scale up the seed. You cannot simply release the variety without seed and not able to go to the farmers. So when you are doing NPTs or not a national performance trials, you need to scale up the breeder seed and the basic seed so that certified hybrid seed could be produced and then deployed to the farmers. Yeah, excellent. And Prasanna, how, I mean, there's an important part here around farmers actually wanting to buy the seed and use it. Is that, I mean, how challenging can that be? There is, there is no premium for the trait. Our Falamivam tolerant hybrids will be sold at the same cost as yeah. any conventional hybrid. So therefore, there is no premium at all. Yeah, that's that's and, the most important thing to to understand. And in your experience of farmers, are they quite willing to change quite quickly from season to season and buy new? It, it is still it is still early days because first of all, uh, in uh, this is the first time any native genetic resistant hybrids are being uh, deployed in a continent like Africa. Mm. Uh, so uh, we need to see it, but I'm sure that it is it's a highly demanded trait. When we do the on-farm evaluations, we understand the farmer's preferences. Yep. It's an extremely highly demanded trait. So I don't foresee any major bottleneck in acceptance of these varieties once released uh, because they not only have falami worm resistance, but are also good for other important traits. So no change in terms of cost, no change in terms of other relevant traits. So there yep. is no reason for... Uh, a, a big bottleneck in consumer acceptance. Okay, excellent. And just getting down to, I guess, the, the always the question is the cost. If we were to establish something like this, maybe one uh, screening facility in, in Southeast Asia, for example, what, and that, that's, I think you sort of indicated that from start to finish, it's sort of more a five, at least a five year sort of type, um, yeah. just to get it going. Uh, yeah. What do you think is the cost of that? And are there sort of innovative ways to sort of, I guess, share that cost amongst different stakeholders? Yeah. You see, what are the basic requirements? You need to have a mass rearing facility, okay, which can produce thousands of neonate larvae every crop season. You should have capacity to screen large number of germplasm entries under artificial infestation in screen houses. It depends upon how big is the breeding program, whether one screen house is, available, is enough or two or three. In Hyderabad, we established four screen houses, okay. four big screen houses. So typically I would say four big screen houses will be costing around 40 to $50,000. Yep. Okay, and then of course the mass rearing laboratory, if it is already available for a for insects, it can be utilized for developing, for, for generating neonate larvae. The typic, the, the one, one important thing to remember is you need to have a solid foundation of a breeding program so yeah. that you are in a position to utilize the germplasm, understand what is required to, to make a, a successful product happen, and then move systematically through what I, what I just uh, presented. Excellent. No, very good. And I guess just just your last question, I guess, I mean, how uh, we talked about and, and you very nicely summarised that threat from climate change and um, the impact on invasive uh, species, plant pest and diseases. How, how big a problem do you think this will be for Southeast Asia? 
see the falam ibam will is is in many countries we are now hearing that the incidence has reduced or the impact has reduced that is typically going to happen when when the incursion happens initially you have very high very high economic impact and then as farmers keep applying uh, various control measures especially these control measures are now typically chemical pesticides they are not biological control they are not augmented to biological control. There is, of course, some increasing awareness about biological control, but how many countries are presently releasing parasitoids or predators for the control of falamibam? Can anybody write that in the chat? <laughs> okay. Here's the question, uh, so, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> so therefore, so at right now, the farmers are accessing only the synthetic pesticides. But at the same time, they are causing irreversible damage to the environment, loss of insect biodiversity. Apart from increasing the cost of cultivation, there are numerous papers that have come up about how the cost of cultivation of maize has increased, although we do see some reduction in falamiwam. So yeah. falamiwam incidents, falamiwam is not going to go away, but the, the, the level of impact will vary from country to country and from crop season to crop season, depending upon the climatic conditions and the level of application of farmers' practices. Uh, so therefore, there is absolutely, just like drought tolerance, drought does not happen every year, but drought tolerance is an important trait to incorporate in our breeding strategy because we never know when drought tolerance, when drought will happen. The same happens with the disease resistance. The same should happen with important traits like falamibam. Yeah, excellent. Well, that's a great place to leave it. Um, Prasanna, you have a few questions in the Q&A. If you could um, just take a little bit of time and sure, answer a few you. of those, that would be great. But thank you so much uh, for, for really kicking us off on a good platform there and really um, uh, drawing our attention to what is possible and the opportunities. So um, thank you very much, Prasanna. Chris, I'm going to introduce you now. Um, Chris uh, works for the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade at Australia uh, as a biosecurity expert. He's many years of experience in policy as well as field work. He's currently the chair of the IPPC focus group on climate change and phytosanitary issues. And he's going to join us today to talk about that uh, and what work they're doing. Um, very briefly, give a summary what they're planning uh, as well uh, around this uh, relationship between climate change and plant pest and disease uh, control and biosecurity. Chris, you just need to unmute yourself and you should be able to share your screen if you wish. I just can't hear you now. You may just need to check your... Um, if you go to the mute button and press the little arrow, Chris, you may see uh, select a speaker. I can't hear you at the moment. Okay, how's that? I can now. Awesome. That's perfect. Yes, I can hear your your calm, reassuring voice. So, <laughs> excellent. So I I'm. Just trying to share my screen, but just in the interest of time, what I'll do is I'll talk through my presentation. Um, Great. Uh, and apologies, I've just returned from a, um, I've been at a, an international agricultural development conference for the past two days and, and stepped out of that and straight into this webinar. So uh, it's great to, to be with everyone. And, and thank you again, Alison, for the invitation. Um, so I'm going to be talking about the work that is happening through the IPBC uh, and the FAO. And for those who are not aware of the IPBC, uh, it is the International Plant Protection Convention, and it is the uh, it is the standard setting body and the the plant protection or plant health and plant biosecurity um, area within the, the FAO. So as Alison said, I, I sit on a number of committees within the IPBC, um, and my most recent um, uh, I guess chairing or, or lead responsibility is for the, the CPM focus group on climate change and phytosanitary issues. So this, um, this particular focus group was established um, mid last year in about September, and it was really established with the, the priorities within the IPBC and, and that across all of the IPBC 
um, uh, members, um, which includes about 180 contracting parties um, of the FAO and, and IPPC. And essentially there's a, a recognition within the IPPC community um, that climate change impacts on plant health aren't just affecting the national and the, the domestic um, uh, uh, production and management uh, of, of, of pests, significant and destructive plant pests, but also uh, it is impacting the phytosanitary um, issues. So uh, for those of you who work in the, the, the biosecurity or the quarantine space, um, you know, how do we incorporate climate change impacts into uh, the global phytosanitary um, uh, movement and safe trade of plant and plant products? So there is a development agenda within the IPBC strategic framework 2020-2030 uh, around the assessment and management of climate change impacts on plant health. And that really provides that strategic um, mandate for the IPBC to look at the impacts of climate change, uh, specifically around safe trade of plants and plant products uh, in relation to pest risk assessment, pest risk management issues and phytosanitary issues. Um, and so I'll talk just a bit uh, in this session about what our focus group is doing over the next four years how that can tie into the work of um, the ASEAN Fall Armyworm uh, Action Plan and, and broader uh, regional transboundary pest issues, and just some of the, the upcoming events and, and opportunities to contribute uh, into the work of the focus group. So as you'll all be aware, climate change is, is obviously very, you know, it's got a lot of profile globally, regionally uh, and nationally. I, I work a lot in the Pacific and uh, region and, and work uh, and our activities in DFAT cover uh, Asia Pacific region, but essentially uh, the work of the IPBC and, and our focus group is really sort of linked to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, and the 13th, goal number 13 of that is, is obviously take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. And we do recognise that climate change will have an impact on, on phytosanitary issues um, yeah, over the, the sort of very short term, medium and, and long term as well. And so a lot of the work out of the IPBC and our focus group is targeted on those broader UN sustainable goals. So our focus group was uh, was originally conceived in uh, 2020. Um, it was approved through all of the governance protocol within the, the IPBC in 2021. And we actually met uh, and convened for the first time last September. And since then, we, we meet on a monthly basis, similar to the IPBC Fall Army Worm Technical Group, of which Alison and Tech and myself are, are members. Um, and our work is really sort of looking at um, combining the technical expertise of experts um, throughout the, the FAO and, and IPBC regions throughout the world um, in, in um, uh, working towards you know, climate change impacts on those phytosanitary issues. And I did um, notice in the previous presentation there was reference to the, the FAO scientific review on the impact of climate change and plant pests. That recommendation or that, that review came out of um, the International Year of Plant Health it is really a, a guiding document for the work that we do in the focus group, recognising that um, climate change does have a, a significant impact on plant health and, and it will um, into the future. But what can we do to mitigate some of those impacts through better phytosanitary measures, through better coordination at that global level? So our focus group, uh, we, we're composed of 10 members. We all have very unique and specialised skills between us. Um, we, we do represent all of the regions. So we represent, uh, again, all of the, the key geographical regions in Africa and Europe, uh, North America, um, South and Central America, the Pacific. Um, and I'm one of the, the Pacific uh, representatives along with um, colleagues from, from New Zealand. And so importantly, you know, we, we don't just focus on one particular region and, and sort of noting that uh, most of the members here will, will be from the sort of Asia Pacific or ASEAN region. Um, it's important that for phytosanitary issues, uh, it's really a global initiative um, because a lot of the, the trade in plant, the plant products do come, you know, do move between those regions. We need to be quite mindful of that. Now, we do have representation from um, 
the IPCC, the International um, Committee of, of Climate Change, or uh, Intergovernmental Panel of uh, Climate Change. And so uh, we try and sort of link in as many climate change professionals and experts in this field as, as much as possible. And our mandate quite sort of uniquely for IPPC is, uh, is out to 2025. So we have a, uh, a three to four year work plan, um, which allows us to really sort of focus on a, a whole range of activities um, over the next four years. So we've got four key outcomes in our, our focus group. The first one is raising awareness of the impacts of climate change on plant health and plant pests. Uh, and so there's a number of fora, a number of opportunities, including um, through the full Army Worm Action Plan, uh, the ASEAN work, um, that we can promote that. Um, there's an International Plant Health Conference in London coming up, and there'll be a number of discussions, an actual plenary session uh, with a number of speakers talking about climate change impacts as it relates to phytosanitary issues, uh, which I'll be presenting at, but really trying to sort of promote um, climate change impacts on, on plant health and plant pests across as many stakeholder groups as possible to, to raise awareness, but also to um, be able to mobilise resources and, and develop um, some resources to assist our uh, our regional partners. The second outcome is enhancing the evaluation and management of risks of climate change to plant health. So uh, again, it's really sort of supporting countries to collect and analyse um, and use climate change uh, impact related information and decision making and support countries in building capacity to try and mitigate the impacts of climate change on plant health. Uh, again, you know, that's very much related to um, MPPOs, National Plant Protection Organisations, but uh, there are tools and systems and, um, and useful resources that, that have been developed in uh, many countries with sort of very um, yeah, extensive resources and really it's trying to sort of use those and harmonise some of those tools and resources like forecasting and modelling, uh, like pest risk analysis and being able to incorporate um, climate change um, uh, features into that process. And, uh, and trying to, again, sort of um, create that uh, technical capacity right across um, the 180 contracting parties of the IPPC. And the third outcome is uh, enhancing the recognition of phytosanitary matters, um, particularly as it, it relates to safe trade. Um, in the International Climate Conference over the last couple of days, around food security and saltwater inundation, a lot of those um, yeah, impacts on, on agricultural systems and agricultural resilience. But really what we are focused on in the, the, the focus group is really how does that relate to, to international and, and phytosanitary trade and, and phytosanitary measures? Um, and how do we minimise the impact of climate change in that um, phytosanitary space? Two minutes, Chris. So we have a number of priorities. Um, uh, we've, we've developed an action plan, which is a four year action plan um, from our, our focus group. We've gone through about six months of review and consultation and um, endorsement processes in the IPPC. And if anyone does, has had experience in the IPPC, it's a very, um, it's quite a bureaucratic process. Um, but encouragingly, we had a lot of support for, for our action plan. So what we've done is, is amongst our 10 members, we put together a list of 30 activities that um, draw on the expertise and skills and experience of all 10 members. Um, and that action plan is really a, a list of activities that might include development of resources, um, webinars, uh, different initiatives, um, pest risk analysis, um, uh, sort of masterclasses. Over the next four years, um, to deliver at a, a global and a regional level. And, uh, and obviously I'll be leading a lot of the, the Asia Pacific work on that. So we do have a number of priorities, noting that 30 activities, as Alison well knows, is a, is, is a very ambitious um, target, particularly in a regional and global sort of delivery and implementation um, uh, program. And so we focus very much on the next uh, year, 12 months, on five really key priorities in our focus group. Um, the first one being raising awareness of the impacts of, of climate change on plant health, and we'll be doing that through a number of webinars and sessions. Uh, the second is enhancing 
uh, IPBC and regional reporting systems to try and identify and share climate change information. So that might be around climate modelling and, and forecasting um, relating to changes in pest distribution, host range and adaptability of pests and, and hosts. So that's really important too in, in being able to um, assess the risk of, of pests uh, to new and, and um, uh, emerging areas. And I do note that uh, we, we have been in discussions with some of our New Zealand counterparts and, uh, and, you know, and, uh, and some of our southern states here in Australia and, um, and obviously full army worm and number of the, the other transboundary pests, the range extension and potential host range, um, you know, in our southern and, and very sort of colder climates um, is a, a very emerging and, um, and big concern. Okay, our third action is, uh, is, thanks Alison, our third uh, priority is developing a uh, climate change impacts on plant health webpage on the IPP, similar to our full army worm website that uh, that Alison and Tech and I have contributed to. So it's a centralised uh, repository and, and resource for, for anyone, and that's all public information. Um, we also want to look at the evaluation and management of risks of, of climate change to plant health through uh, pest risk analysis for those of you who are involved in that. And again, looking at sort of evolved surveillance and monitoring systems. And the last priority for us is developing an IPPC guide um, to assist national plant protection organisations across the world in identifying, assessing, and mitigating and managing climate change impacts on plant health. And again, that's that's designed um, in a very similar concept as our full army worm uh, prevention, preparedness and response guide. So that's really an overview of our focus group. Um, again, I'll send through the presentation that, um, that I wasn't able to share, unfortunately, but it does, does provide some detail around the actual action plan. And if anyone's interested in having a look at that action plan, uh, it is available on the IPPC website. I'm also happy to, to email you a copy of it directly. But um, again, it's a, it's a great opportunity for FAO and IPPC coordination and collaboration into the, the full army work, to the ASEAN full army worm action plan and the work that we're doing. And I think it complements a lot of the management and bioprotection and, and biocontrol type work that's happening um, more from the, obviously the, the prevention and the preparedness and response space. Great. Thanks, Thank Alison, and happy thanks, to Thanks, Chris. Yeah, no, thanks, Chris. That's excellent. And it would be great to have your presentation. I'm not sure if you've got a link that you can share with us as well, maybe in the chat, just over the next uh, couple of coming minutes, uh, just so that people can see what the plan, the action plan is and um, what actions you're thinking. A quick question for you, very quick, because we need to move on. But what is there going to be funding available from this uh, IP? PC, uh, FAW, FAO sort of uh, work for countries in Southeast Asia, for example, to to do research or work? Is, is there any funding available? Um, very frankly, no, Alison. If anything, the FAO and the IPBC are, uh, are looking to countries, looking to donors, looking to, to regional organisations to actually fund the delivery and implementation of this action plan. Uh, yeah. There are a number of the activities that are being de um, delivered um, by countries uh, through technical programs and the like, um, but there is a, a quite a significant um, resourcing need. So a lot of our workers in the focus group is also trying to promote and advocate for funding to support the action plan. Um, I guess, you know, we are quite keen to to tap into existing research and development initiatives like yep. um, okay. the, the ASEAN Bioprotection Centre and, and our full Army Worm Action Plan. Um, but uh, again, I think, you know, through the ACCPC and our regional bodies, that's probably the best mechanism to be able to implement some of this work and to draw on our regional uh, research and development experts. Excellent. Thanks, Chris. And thanks for the presentation and the update. I think it's important that people are becoming aware of what work is actually happening at a central level there um, within the IPPC and, and can participate as well and, and find out what's happening. So thank you so much for giving us that update, Chris. I very appreciate it. And, and thanks for joining us very quickly after your conference as well. Very efficiently done. 
Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm just going to call on uh, Liam actually uh, from the Plant Protection Research Institute from Vietnam. Liam, can you can you unmute yourself? I'm just going to ask Liam a question. I wanted to ask a few people from the region, but what work are you doing around this climate change, uh, plant pest and disease uh, intersection within the Plant Protection Research Institute in Vietnam? Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, Anyone? I can. Yep. Yeah, okay. Good afternoon. Um, actually, yes, we did study on impact of climate change to the pests and disease in Vietnam. And a number of studies have been conducted, but not many and not regularly due to limited funding. We have one project that uh, evaluation the impact of climate change to the outbreaks of key pests and disease on major crops in Vietnam conducted during to 2013 to 2015. In this project, we did the main the chain of pests and disease of three key crops, uh, such as rice, dragon fruit, and coffee. So we, we determine the chain of uh, species compositions the incidence of the pest and disease and the damage severity of this pest on these crops. We also determine the occurrence of new emerging pests and disease on these crops. And we develop warning and predicting of the chain of pests and disease on major crops in different ecological areas in Vietnam under climate change conditions. We have another Groups that are projects that we screening and selecting drought tolerant rice cultivars for adaptation to climate change in Central Coast uh, region in Vietnam. And this project is conducted, uh, was conducted in uh, 2013 and to 2015. Yeah. In this project, we estimated and developed a map of severity of droughts in Central Coast region under climate change, San Rairo. And we also develop a map of tolerant rice cultivars to drought condition. And then we screen and select some good uh, drought tolerant rice cultivar for uh, this uh, area. And uh, we have another project uh, that collaborated with the uh, Aarhus University of Denmark. A title is Climate Change Impact on Outbreak of Brown Plant Hopper and option for prevention. And you know that uh, brow plant hopper is key pest of rice in Vietnam and in many other countries in the region. So this project aim to develop a model for predict outbreak of brow plant hopper in Vietnam based uh, on information of nine history and the climate change scenario including the increasing of temperature and uh, carbon dioxide contents in atmosphere. Hmm. And we also develop policy and strategy to uh, help prevent uh, brown plant hopper outbreak in Vietnam. And uh, recently, uh, we have a research project, although it's not defined as climate change project, study of the impact of uh, different climate condition to the outbreak of tea mosquito uh, on uh, some crops such as uh, uh, cashew avocado, tea, and coffee in Shenzhen Hainan uh, region of Vietnam. And this project aims to provide evidence of the impact of climate change to the pests uh, in uh, uh, occurring in Vietnam. And we also have some research activity of the transboundary pest NDC in collaboration with uh, Korea and Japan. And uh, we focus uh, mainly on uh, rice pests, such as uh, brown plant hopper, white bike plant hopper. Yep. So we have some activity on this uh, session, and we do hope that we can have more support from overseas to see what happened with uh, pest NDC in Vietnam under climate change condition. Thank you.
Thank you so much, Liam. And thank you for giving us that summary. Um, really useful. And I'm sure there's lots of others um, in the room as well that where there's work going on that we don't know of. So it was fantastic to hear that. So thank you for giving us that update, uh, Liam, from Vietnam, from the Plant Protection Research Institute. Uh, very well received. I'm, I'm going to now introduce our next two speakers, uh, which uh, Sulav uh, uh, Pordal and also Craig Phillips uh, from Ag Research in New Zealand. They're going to give a joint presentation. So I think they're going to be, um, so whoever's starting could share their screen if, if you would like. You should be able to do that. Um, and I'm going to let you introduce yourselves because uh, I think that would be nice. We haven't had you speak at any of our uh, presentations uh, before or, or webinars. So I think, Sulav, are you starting or? Craig. Well, yeah, I can I can go. go okay, you're first. just on yeah. your notes. You're on your notes uh, presentation at the moment. So if you just change that to your full. Uh, where do I go? Okay. Maybe use. Yeah. Does it work? Yep. Perfect. Go for it, to love. Uh, is it still like? No, you got onto notes again. Uh huh. Yeah. I'll just, just a minute, I think this would be all right. Okay. That's it, perfect. Stay there. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, wonderful to have you both join us. And um, they're going to talk around uh, the relationship between climate change and transboundary pests in Southeast Asia, and also just provide some food for thought for all of us in the room around what could be some of the work that we could progress. So we're really keen to hear your thoughts on, on what they suggest. So Sulav, uh, please feel free to start. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Elson. Yeah, thanks for the invitation and the opportunity. I think we have had like a great couple of talks ahead of us. I think there was a good background to ours, actually. So yeah, uh, just to introduce myself, uh, my name is Sula Podil. I'm currently a scientist uh, working at AgriSearch New Zealand. My area of expertise includes uh, tropical pest management and uh, insect biosecurity. Uh, in the past, you know, I've, I've been involved in several, uh, you know, international pest management programs uh, from in, from the U.S. to you know Latin America uh, to parts of South Asia and Southeast Asia, and more recently in the South Pacific countries. Um, with that, I also have Craig Phillips uh, with me. So, Craig, if you could introduce yourself. Sure. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'm Craig Phillips. I'm also in ag research at Lincoln in the South Island of New Zealand with SULAF. Um, I've worked in insect pest management and border biosecurity for about the last 30 years. Um, I do quite a lot of pest risk analysis research and also climate related modelling. Okay, so yeah, uh, in, for the next you know 15 to 20 minutes, uh, Craig and I will be you know like um, presenting some of our ideas um, in terms of you know climate change and transboundary pest in Southeast Asia, and that would be for discussion as well. So yeah, uh, just to start with uh, a bit about outline of our talk. So we'll briefly int introduce AgriSearch, our organization. Um, then we will you know we will discuss. Uh, few ideas that we have based on some of the work that we have done in New Zealand uh, in terms of you know climate change and transboundary pest and some of the possible areas for <clears throat> Southeast Asia. So yeah, uh, AgriSearch Agri is like one of the, is the second largest uh, crown research institute in New Zealand. Um, uh, we have like more than 700 staffs working all around the country. And we are mostly focusing on focus on you know research regard uh, to uh, regarding pastoral industries in, in pastures, uh, but uh, New Zealand Agri Research is also like one of the key partners of the New Zealand New Zealand Better Border Biosecurity Program in sort uh, B3, uh, which does you know which is like interagency collaboration between um, several CRIs and universities and um, works to prevent. Um, this, to pre prevent the invasion of uh, several insects and diseases uh, that are possible threats to New Zealand agriculture. Um, internationally, uh, we have uh, we have several international programs, uh, largely in the Pacific, um, and we have some in Latin America, and more recently, we have started working in uh, Southeast Asia, particularly in Cambodia. <clears throat> so. 
I think uh, I think our early speaker, uh, Dr. Prasanna, um, I think highlighted, you know, like um, give a good good you know an indication on like how climate change is kind of in you know, expanding the range as well as um, you know emerging pest threats. Uh, to agriculture as a whole. Uh, and I think Chris Dale also kind of highlighted, you know, like the importance um, in, within the IPCC um, discussing forum. So uh, I think that's, uh, so So based on like some of our work that we have been doing uh, in this space in New Zealand, here we kind of, you know, uh, outline three major areas of work uh, that could that we could do possibly for Southeast Asia. Again, you know, we don't have uh, much experience. We have very limited experience in this region. So yeah, these are up for discussion. So uh, these potential areas include the first one, climate matching applications um, for, South, for the region. Uh, second, predicting, you know, future biotic threats, uh, which, which are um, problematic for Southeast Asian agriculture. And in the meantime, estimating, you know, distribution as well as impacts of these key threats both uh, in, uh, under current as well as future um, climatic scenarios. So these are some of the, you know, some of the uh, ideas that we have and we will kind of discuss this through. So Craig, if you want to take us through. The yeah, next few so slides. What, what we're describing is just some of the things that um, have been found useful in New Zealand that might be uh, worth discussing in terms of, in the context of Southeast Asia. So one thing we developed um, four, five or six years ago now was this climate matching app for our Ministry for Primary Industries, who are our main phytosanitary authority. And um, they wanted to understand what the climatic similarities were between New Zealand and the rest of the world to help them understand where uh, risk species may come from. And this is based on Climax's Composite Match Index. And um, they, we developed this rudimentary app online for them um, several years ago, and then recently have been upgrading that with some new functionality that they want, which includes um, a whole lot of stuff around future climate scenarios. Next slide, please, Suda. So there's the, the old version is that top URL there. Suda might put that into the um, chat so that you can access it if you want. It's publicly available. The second one is the new one, which is still just a beta version. We're still testing it, so I can't share that yet, but I can quickly show you a little bit of it. Um, help me out with my share screen here. Should be able to just oh, see. So help me out with, yep, oh, here you we should go. share screen, share screen the down the bottom. Now. Yep, and you should yep. be able to just share yep. it from there. I'm a Teams person, not a... Um, <laughs> That's okay. Yeah, it's good to be a teams a teams yeah. person. <laughs> so um, th this is the the beta version of the app, but um, quite a few uh, organisations have contributed to it. We've done all the the climate um, analysis and created all the data for the app. Uh, the work is being driven by MPI. Uh, they're defining you know what they want. Epi Interactive is um, are our colleagues in Wellington who are really good at putting this stuff together into an online tool. Um, here, we are looking at the climatic similarities between New Zealand down here in the bottom right-hand corner and the rest of the world. These are climatic similarities are given as a number between zero and one. The number appears up underneath the legend here when I hover over an area. Zero is, um, a very poor match and a one is a perfect match between New Zealand and the climate in this in the, that location. You can see that for New Zealand, Southeast Australia is really climatically matched with New Zealand. So you can imagine you might do something like this for Southeast Asia and have uh, individual countries within Southeast Asia analyzed separately or regions within countries analyzed separately. And here um, we're looking at um, a match of current climates, but you can look um, at a range of different possibilities here. So, for example, this is um, New Zealand's climate uh, predicted for 2070 compared to the world's now. So you might think, oh, okay, so what's what parts of the world will New Zealand's climate be like in 2070? 
Um, another thing that MPI wanted is to be able to compare locations in, in different parts of the world, not between New Zealand, but say between New York and Paris or something like that. So um, we've set up that functionality there too. There's a bunch of other um, attributes of this app that I haven't got time to explain now, but um, maybe something like that would be useful in Southeast Asia. Next, uh, there we go, Celeb, it's all you. Yeah, let's share the screen. I think you can go it, yeah. Yeah, so um, another area we've been working a lot in, in New Zealand is helping our agricultural industries to understand what their future biosecurity threats are. And the, sort of in the general process that we take is to, with our uh, industry partners, choose the crops that they uh, hold as most important and then we basically use a variety of methods to compile lists of every organism that's ever been recorded um, harming that crop. And then we have some methods that um, we use to prioritize all those hazards to identify the ones that are most likely to arrive in New Zealand and establish here. Um, those might be, you know, probably, they would need tweaking for Southeast Asia, but they might, might be possible for them to work there. And then, um, as I'll explain in a moment, we go on, the highest hazards will go on and um, model their um, potential distributions in New Zealand, their potential spread rates and their potential costs. Um, next slide, please, Sulev. So we began this work with Dairy New Zealand who, and the dairy sector in New Zealand is actually our biggest export receipt earner. Um, and now that work is continuing with a range of other uh, primary industries in New Zealand. Uh, I'll mention quickly, I'll share my screen again. The, um, we, um, Dairy New Zealand, you know, this work has been going on for a couple of years. There's something like 20 reports we've produced for Dairy New Zealand on various elements of the pest risk analysis work that we've been doing for them. The, um, I need to point out that a bunch of people have been contributing to this. And um, what Dairy New Zealand has really liked about is we've been putting the information as we've been compiling it or producing it into this online book. And um, which means that all their work um, is accessible to them online in one place. And they can, you know, go to different sections of the report, which we've written as papers and which we intend to publish um, when we get time. And um, the nice thing about this online way of presenting information is that, um, you know, you can... Um, it's interactive. So this is the potential New Zealand estimated potential New Zealand distribution of one pest, and you know there's others. You can see them all, um, and then we model their um, spread through the country, and this is the number of years that we expect them to take to spread, and then we model their um, cumulative costs as they're spreading. The nice thing about this um, medium for presenting the information is that it's uh, interactive. And so you can kind of interrogate the plots and stuff nicely. Um, and then the, you can provide the data in ways that they can be searched or filtered or sorted or downloaded, et cetera. Okay, so that. Okay, I'll save. Okay, so thanks. So thanks, Craig. So yeah, uh, you know, the third area of uh, inquiry would be to estimate future distribution and impacts from 
current high impact pace. Actually, we have kind of developed a method for doing that. We have been doing that for uh, some of the places that are already in New Zealand. And um, for South East Asia, possible, you know, study pace could include uh, paste like fall armium, uh, rice blast, uh, rice brown, brown plant hopper, citrus greening, as well as fruit fly. And these, these five pests were recently identified uh, from, a, from a study from a food and agriculture organization is um, one of the five major uh, transboundary pests for Southeast Asia. So I think it would be good to like uh, focus on these um, these pests. So yeah, and um, just to give you an idea on some of our work in this area. So in the picture in the right, you'll see you know like here um, it was this study was done before uh, fall armyworm was found in New Zealand. So we basically using climatic models. Uh, we projected you know climate suitability for uh, maize, which is the major host, as well as fall armyworm in New, New Zealand under uh, 50 years of climatic change scenario. So yeah, as something similar could be uh, done for other based in within Southeast Asia as well. Uh, similarly, uh, one of our most recent work um, on fall armyworm worm actually uh, it started right after when uh, fall armyworm was first reported from New Zealand earlier this year. So you know. Um, we were using using different climatic models, you know, um, we asked two, two major questions, for example, are New Zealand winters cold enough, uh, cold enough to kill fall armyworm? If not, you know, where in New Zealand it is likely to persist. So we looked into, you know, like uh, the possibility of number of generations that uh, that fall armyworm could have in different parts of New Zealand under under current uh, current scenario. So yeah, those are, uh, so uh, the two pictures that you see are the results from those two uh, models. Again, you know, like these are the things, uh, these are the kind of work that we could um, do, you know, with, with Southeast Asian paste as well. So yeah, uh, the last slide. So basically, you know, on importance and application of this approach. So on the left, you'll see, you know, that I have outlined few of the application of, uh, of each of the three um, idea that we presented. So first, you know, climate matching application, which would really help to kind of identify potential sources of location for, you know, future um, insect and pest that could arrive in Southeast Asia. So yeah, that would be very helpful. And in, in the meantime, you know, uh, we could use um, those knowledge, we could use this approach to um, basically, you know, like uh, estimate um, the, the economic cost from different pests that, that will, or you know like that have already arrived in Southeast Asia, and in the right, you know, I have kind of um, compiled few you know like applications. So um, as we all know that you know like losses from insect pests are likely to increase um, in the in the future uh, with climate warming as well as uh, increasing trade um, and all these transboundary pest issues. So uh, it is important for us to be you know like uh, vigilant. And I think the information from this kind of work would really help and support the government as well as non-government agencies to develop a strategy, a biosecurity strategy to respond to, uh, to basically to prevent first and then to, you know, like respond to growing, um, growing transboundary based issues in the region. Uh, and, and at the end, you know, I was really happy to hear from, you know, like from Vietnam, I think from somebody from Vietnam was mentioning that, you know, like uh, there has been uh, some work going in this space so we would you know would be interested on like learning on um yeah what do they think about some of the ideas that we have presented here and with that i would like to thank thank elson and all for listening and we'd be happy to take any questions if you have Excellent. Thanks, Sir Love, and thanks, Craig. Um, great presentation, and it's given us quite a lot of food for thought, I think, there. Uh, if you if you can stop sharing your screen, we can yep. see uh, all the speakers. Sure. You can um, put your your your, uh, your video on if you want. Um, that, really interesting. Quite a few, a couple of questions here. Um, uh, uh, great presentation, um, firstly. Uh, and the first question is, you had some, I think, some modelling there of that you were looking at around fall armyworm uh, distribution in New Zealand. You were looking at, for example, the impact of, of could it overwinter in New Zealand, uh, et cetera, and how many generations potentially 
uh, could exist uh, in a New yep. Zealand sort of season. Have you found out any early results yet, or do you have any sort of early thoughts on 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 the answers to that, or are you still in the in the modelling phase, or what what could be an update um, there? We're um, we are taking three main modelling approaches, um, and they're all suggesting that it will overwinter in the north of New Zealand and depending on the year, um, other parts of New Zealand possibly as well. Um, and so we're midwinter now, we haven't had a detection of fall armyworm for a while. We are planning um, to do a whole lot of sampling in collaboration with growers throughout the country starting this spring using pheromone traps to, um, to get an idea of where it did over winter and also how quickly it migrate, if it did over winter, migrates from those sites into um, maize crops. And, um, and then uh, another modeling approach we're developing, another model we're developing at the moment is a day degree model. So we know the number of generations, et cetera. And the long-term goal is to be able to predict when it's gonna arrive in crops, when pheromone trapping should begin and when uh, the first control measures might be applied. Excellent. Thanks, Greg. Um, and just, I guess, what's quite interesting, there's some really, I, all the ideas were really interesting. Um, how much, when, I mean, the second one, you had quite a comprehensive resource there, uh, looking at a whole lot of it, virtually every kind of plant pest and disease, I think that could be an issue uh, for pastures, I guess, forage um, crops for, for dairy. Um, how long does something like that take to come together? I mean, would it be, do you think as a first step in Southeast Asia, it might be best to sort of concentrate on a, some priority plant pest and diseases and, and build the knowledge up around there? Or, or do you try and do everything at once? And how long does that sort of take and what kind of resources needed for that? Mm, the um... The, the focus for our sectors has been on on species that aren't in the country yet. So yep. the majority of our work has been trying to identify what's most likely to arrive and, and cause problems for them so they can prioritise what their preparedness and response um, plans should look like. Um, yep. We have do, do similar work looking at how pests will change their distributions and the number of generations per year, et cetera, um, with climate change in New Zealand, but that's been um, a smaller body of work. Yep. The, um, we have this, what I think is quite a nice arrangement where our Better Border Biosphere Research Collaboration funds us to develop and continue to refine our pest risk analysis methods to, um, you know, basically to continue to improve them. Yep. And our goal is to um, put as many of the methods as we can into computer scripts so that we um, are basically as transparent and repeatable as possible and remove yep. as much subjectivity in the analyses as possible. Some, you know, it's impossible to remove it all, but we're having a good crack at it. So we're finding that as we, as we continue through this process, we are getting faster at it. Um, and so it's quite reasonably well for refined for insects now. Insects are what we're best at, and it's fastest, I would say. You know, for the one diseases, crop, is it is it adapt? Are you looking at diseases as well? We're just beginning, so okay. we're we're best at insects. We're okay at weeds, and we're just beginning to um, work on plant pathogens. Okay. So, um, and so our methods for plant pathogens haven't been well refined or tested yet. Okay, thanks, Craig. Um, another question here: Could the app predict the yield loss or potential yield loss? No, that the app that I showed it, um, it it's um, doesn't have any information about pests in it. It's only about climates. So okay. you could, you can, you know, one one thing we have done for MPI is. So choose where um, kiwi fruit grows in New Zealand and compare locations in New Zealand where kiwi fruit grows, grows to other all other locations in the world so yep. that having a good idea of exactly which parts of the world have similar climates to where we grow kiwi fruit here in New Zealand. So you can certainly do those sorts of things, but there's no, no information about the biology of pests and that it's purely a 
comparison between climatic variables. Yeah. Okay. Great. Thanks, Gray. Um, I'm sure there'll be lots more questions. Um, I'm I, I'm going to finish the uh, the session now, um, but I'd like to say thank you very much, and I'm going to just explain sort of some next steps because we're going to sort of come back and revisit this. But thank you, firstly, to both of you. Um, a very good presentation. Really nice to see some options thrown out there. It's a really good um, sort of platform today just to sort of start socialising what we could do, and uh, we're going to come back with some feedback. So you've already got some, um, you've got some reactions there coming up through the screen so thank you so much to love and and craig for joining us and i'd just like to thank everyone uh, all our speakers um climate change is a serious threat as well as uh these um plant pest and diseases and the combination is a huge challenge for farmers and our wider food systems uh it's also an opportunity here i think though for better plant health uh, um really, because uh, this is something that actually is really critical for managing plant pest and diseases and also managing climate change and building resilience of, of our farmers' crops. So I think Prasanna really nicely um, introduced that sort of concept at the very start. Um, very uh, four fantastic speakers. Uh, and what we hope to do next is provide a summary of the discussion today uh, and along with your thoughts shared in the chat and a survey that I'm going to send out because I really want to know and find out more about what's actually happening in the region. We heard a bit from uh, Liam before who said there wasn't much happening but then proceeded to tell us quite a bit. So uh, I have a feeling that might be true uh, across the region. So very important to find out what we are doing, important to find out what you think we should be doing uh, and also combine Combine that with some of these ideas that Sue Love and Craig uh, have shared with us today to see what you think of that and also um, to share with you what um, is happening in that IPPC uh, um, focus group on climate change and transboundary pests as well. So we will um, we will collect that information together. We'll come back to you. Following on from this workshop is part B on population genomics and resistance uh, and the importance of understanding populations when designing solutions and approaches for better plant health uh, in, in a changing climate. Um, and that will be uh, a very interesting session too uh, that tech will be helping to lead. So look, um, some really good ideas, uh, fantastic session. Thank you so much to uh, Prasanna, Chris, Sulav and Craig for joining us today. Thanks Liam for your, um, uh, your, your also your intervention. And I know there are a few others that I'd, uh, we're going to speak today, but we, we've run out of time, but there will be time later. Uh, we'll be following this up. Uh, so thank you for joining for this important session and keep safe everyone. Uh, and uh, we'll see you in part two of this workshop series. Thank you. Excellent. Thank, Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye